Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. This is going to be our final reading. We're going to be finishing up the Magdalene Manuscript today. The last couple of weeks have had me bawling like a little baby. Hopefully that won't happen today because I worked really hard on my makeup. So hopefully <laughs> that won't happen. But as sad as I am to see this book go, I always get a little bit sentimental when we finish our books. I am, however, super excited about the book. We're going to be starting next week on Tuesdays. And this is going to be the Hathor material, which is also by Tom Kenyon who was the channeler for the Magdalene manuscript. I will put a link to this book down in the description box below for anybody who wants to buy the book to follow along with us with their own copy of the book. As always, because I am reading these books on the channel, if that's not something you can afford at the moment, totally understand. That's why I'm reading them aloud. Of course, I always want everyone to have their own copy because then that gives you the opportunity to reread stuff and take notes, all that kind of stuff. But as always, these will always be up if money is tight at the moment. The interesting thing about this book is that it comes with these CDs, which I have not listened to yet. There's one in the front and there's one in the back, mainly because I don't have a CD player. <laughs> so maybe um, Tom Kenyon, if you're listening, um, not many of us have CD players anymore. Although I think there might be a CD player in my car. I'm not hundred percent sure. I've never tried to play a CD in my car because now we use iPads and, you know, more playlist, digital playlists. But um, I'm going to go look at my car and see if I can listen to these in my car. But I do believe that the CDs are maybe Tom's. We learned from the Magdalene manuscript that Tom is very, um, he's got a gift with vocals. And this is actually... While I was reading the Magdalene manuscript, this is why I decided to do this book because she speaks a lot about the Hathors. And so I was like, oh my God, that's going to be our next book. We're going to read about the Hathors and Tom's book on them. I've told you guys many times, I'm not the one that's picking these books. It's, it's, it's God, it's spirit, it's Magdalene herself who is guiding this channel and telling us which books to cover. The books just kind of fall into my lap. And I, I really just kind of go with that. I go with what books fall into my lap. Um, if I'm reading about a book and there's a, a keen like pay attention to this. I'll order that book. I know what book we're going to do after we finish The Return of the Divine Sophia, which we do on Mondays. I won't tell you guys yet, but I already have that book lined up too. So anyway, um, yeah. So once again, there'll be a link in the description box below for this book. And again, this copy does have some CDs. So maybe we can have a conversation about the CDs if you guys get the copy with the CDs, because uh, maybe if you guys are in the same boat that I am, or we don't actually have a CD player. So, but anyway, let's go ahead and get started on our final section of the Magdalene manuscript. So last week we finished off with um, uh, Judy finishing up her story. Uh, Pam Kenyon, Tan's first wife, had passed away. And now her and Tom are on this journey of being together. And so we're starting in my book, we're starting on page 280, which is titled Afterthoughts, A Diary After Mary Magdalene. The following entries were all written the year after we received the manuscript and all the way up to until the publication. We felt they were pertinent as they show a process of what this material and our commitment to the truth brought forward in our lives. Be warned, it isn't always pretty, but isn't the truth. It's a diary of what happened for me and living this material the best I could. Back on our little outish, just as Magdalene was nearing the end of delivering the manuscript, I went through a torturous process and we felt it important enough to share, to show that it isn't always bliss that comes first. It's hardly ever bliss that comes first, to be honest with you guys. First, the man and the woman come together and out of their love, a child is born. Yes, that's the Isis, the Osiris, and the Horus. The Horus is the sacred child. It's interesting. My friend Cindy was talking about, um, you know, she studies all of this as well. And she's talking about how we went from the age of Isis to the age of Osiris. And now we're moving into the age of Horus, the union of both masculine and feminine, which is the sacred relationship. So that's right. The eye of Horus is not satanic, even though the Satanists use the eye of Horus. The darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can create. And so everything that the Satanists use was at one point created by the light. And it's our job, instead of destroying it, it's our job to take it back. 
it was ours to begin with. So let's take it back. All right, so let's start that again. First, the man and woman come together and out of their love, a child is born. In sacred relationship, there is always creation. A third energy is always birthed, correct? And birth is painful, but there is a reward. A new life is created, whether it is a child or an energy. In our case, our work gets birthed into the world. I'm afraid love is like that. It's a process, like all of life. And you know what Pam said, it's the process that matters. By the way, Tom never saw what I was writing in my story until it was done, and I read it to him. When I read him the first part about when I saw the little boy's face in the back of the bus, he crooked his head and interrupted to tell me that when he was really young, maybe eight or nine, his family was traveling through Virginia along Route 1 on a bus, and he saw a little girl in a car. And the car and the bus traveled alongside each other, and he and little girl stared at each other until the vehicles parted, and he never forgot her. It was a long shot, but I believe in long shots. I'm going to ask Michael and Gabriel and all of the um, beings that are here for my highest good and the collective's highest good to be here right now to protect this recording, to keep the vocals and the visual on the same track, and to um, keep out any spirits that are human or otherwise that are here to try to derail the work that's being done. I ask that you remove those entities. They don't have my consent. And I thank you so much to all the spirits that are here for our highest good for protecting this recording and this reading. I believe in long shots too, actually. I believe that there is, there's no, there's no such thing as coincidence, right? It's everything has purpose and meaning. So an obscuration to flight, my first entry, December, 2000, Outish Island. The storm lasted at least five, maybe seven days. My storm lasted almost 14 days, maybe more. In my paranoia, I even wondered if perhaps somehow the external storm had been called up my, but by my own boiling, stewing, festering water depths. Externally, the sea lashed out at the tiny island with a fury akin to my own boil. Hurricanes and such identified storms are horrific, but they have a beginning a middle, and an end. This storm blew in and swirled and stayed, blowing at my back even now as I write. In the beginning, it was worse at night, so that days were still somehow manageable. Midway through, it was constant, with no place to go in the limestone house to escape the howling. We put towels underneath the door to stop the scraping of wood and metal on limestone a sound akin to fingernails on a chalkboard but the wind still found enough space to enter so that it whirled through the bedroom into the bathroom and resonated down the bathtub drain, creating such a banshee sound I could never describe. It's funny, I'm kind of a weirdo. I don't mind nails on a chalkboard, that sound. What I do mind is rubbing fabrics together. So if you would like to take your shirt and bend it and like rub the fabrics together, I can't stand that. That's why I always have to like roll my sleeves because I just can't stand the fabric like getting stuck and rubbing together. Maybe, like I said, maybe I'm just a weirdo, but okay. We were driven downstairs into the spare room and it took the wind longer to find us there. In martial form, it escaped the sea wall in its fury and threw huge boulders across the street, aiming for the houses that encrouched on the beach and bouncing them off the limestone like a mad bowler. They lay in such litter on the street that it was undrivable. Between Zabit and Mal's form on the road back by the sea, the waves leapt at such heights that they were turquoise at the very tops as they turned to froth, pounding the rocky beach, then dragging the rocks back to the depths from which they had escaped. I had never seen turquoise illum illuminated waves and hoped to never forget the color or the cause or the sound of thousands of rocks being dragged to shore and dragged back into the sea and each thrust of turquoise. Internally, I suspect this material and the timing of the presentation of this material. By that, I mean we were all having little fissures, mortared over, spackled, painting a, paint, painted a pretty, acceptable color with throw rocks covering even the hint of anything not perfect. A simple incident occurred, innocent and simple, but it dug down into my foundation and found a sympathetic fissure and began a process of disintegrating everything I thought I knew and believed. 
It grew and grew in proportion until every moment of every day was engaged in examination and torture of some aspect of this little tiny fissure. I do not write this, nor do I choose to detail this very personal incident, but to show how the process can work so that it not just rip up the very foundation of my being for only myself. What do you fear? It will come to your door if you choose the path of the initiate. Absolutely. Absolutely it will. If you choose a path of spirituality in this life, if you choose to actually do the work, then your karma is going to be amplified. But you picked it. All right? Spirituality isn't rainbows and unicorns and butterflies. I've said this since the beginning. Spirituality is dirty. It's dark. It's the dark night of the soul. It's painful. It's immensely painful. But that's what it is. Um, I said this with Catherine Edwards, and I'll say it again. Um, my friend Cindy, who comes on this channel all the time, we were talking about this in, um, in her yoga shala and her mystery school where I teach on Sundays. And she was like, you know, this idea of human suffering is, is a huge, huge topic spoken about, especially in yoga. It's pretty much what the whole yoga sutras are really about is, what is human suffering? What is the human condition? In order for there to be a mystic, there has to be suffering. Because without suffering, we don't ask questions. Without suffering, we're just content and accept. We don't question the mysteries of life. We don't question who we are. We don't question what our soul is. But when suffering occurs, when that pain, that, that real raw pain hits us over, and over and over again when we're knocked down to our knees by the world and we're on the edge of hanging on that's when we question and that's when we explore so suffering is necessary for there to, there to be spiritual evolution and so when you pick a path of the initiate as they're calling it of, of the students when you pick a path of spirituality you're asking for your suffering to be almost magnified, for your karma to be sped up because you're asking to ask the questions. And even though it's painful and even though it's hard, it's incredibly beautiful at the same time. I fear betrayal and abandonment. Same girl, same. And I have experienced an immense amount of betrayal and abandon in my life. And that is two of the things that I fear the most and I very publicly very publicly went through a huge betrayal on YouTube not too long ago I was in one of the safest places in the world surrounded by people who love and adore me and my fears still found me it was not fear of the wind I only saw the mirror and its turbulence and I'm certainly not saying I created the storm I am only noticing the reflections of its fury out of the calm and I am aware that it, like my storm, will have its seasons. The question for examination was, what had caused the storm? Was there a change in the bar barometrics? And could I determine what had changed in the pressure around me so that my own storm, the internal storm, might have its glory and allow me to go back to my blissful state of relationship? The incident had just occurred, and it was insignificant though it carried a message to my ears that sounded louder than it needed to have sounded. And why was that? Magdalene had just given the information about how crucial it was for the woman's floor to be strong and safe and how she needed to know that she was loved and that she was safe. And I had even re reveled in that information, knowing how sweet and clear that message would sound to such weary, tired ears as we women have. I knew we needed to feel secure, to fully blossom the poppy seed does not look the same that has been beaten by the wind and dashed against rocks but look at the tall poppy that has stood in the field alongside other such poppies flanked by supporting stalks safely looking into the sun just like the right amounts of moisture and sunlight and darkness she is all she can be in that environment how many of us are ever safe and secure enough to be all that we can be how many of us even know all we are and all we could be? We don't even know the full potential of our own selves. 
I was told as a little child that I would have every experience a human could have. So then when I spoke, it would be from experience and that I would have something of value to say. It was a strange thing to be told while sitting in the fork of a pear tree when you're five years old. And I never forgot it. And so when I talk about how you can't perform under the stress of abuse, I speak from the horror of experience. I spent five years with a horribly abusive man. The abuses were slow to appear at the beginning, or I tell myself I would have never gotten caught up in such a situation. And in the beginning, they were mostly verbal. Then he began to systematically cut me off from my friends, though I didn't detect any danger in that. Then when I least expected it, completely out of the blue, not attached to an argument or a disagreement, he would strike me, leaving me almost disbelieving the event had occurred. It was demeaning, demoralizing, paralyzing, and almost drove me mad. It is beyond dishonoring. The word dishonoring is so trivial to the degree of shame and degradation that abuse creates. I examined every aspect of every move I had made prior to those blows. What had I said? What had I done? There was nothing I had done. Did I dream it? And I was much too ashamed to let anyone know it was happening. I was far too evolved to allow such behavior. And besides, thank you, religion. It must have been my fault. We are, after all, such wicked creatures filled with guilt and created in sin and shame. But that horrible relationship had ended with me still alive. I had put years and a lot of work between those incidents and me. And now here I am in the most amazing, powerful, loving, honoring fulfilling relationship I have ever even read about, much less experienced, and I am feeling frightened and insignificant and jealous of nothing, and every insecurity has moved into my head and taken up residence, haunting me, hounding me, all because of one tiny little incident. I should tell you that nothing happened. No one did anything to me. There was a simple communication in an email between Tom and someone else, and I took the message and extrapolated it. I boiled it, dissected it, reassembled it, recarved it, served it to all the voices in my head and published my report. I was wounded, perhaps fatally wounded, but I can handle it. I'm an initiate. I'm living a dream life. I resonated. So I tried to put up a tiny bearable, visible throw rug over the insignificant dent in the linoleum. And then Magdalene delivered these words. The next level to understand has to do with the emotional turning of the female initiate. For the female's initiate's receptivity is dependent upon her emotional state. This is part of her nature and cannot be sidestepped if these techniques are to work. She went on as if that wasn't enough to stir the soup. Essential to the female initiate is the authentic feeling of safety and love or appreciation at the very least. When these are in place, something within her being lets go and allows the alchemy to occur. The alchemy is created by the joining of the male initiate's ka and the female initiate's ka. As they make love, the ka bodies interconnect and this causes the female to open her magnetic floor. I froze as she continued to speak. This is a strange term. It comes from the language used in the temples of Isis. The floor is the foundation upon which one stands. When we set something to be secure, we place it on the floor. So the floor was used as a type of slang within the temples, referring to the very basic piece that is required. So when I say the female's magnetic floor, I am saying that this is the fundamental piece that has to occur. The light winds turned to gale force, the sea whipped, and the throw rug was blown away. Something greater than my timidity had ripped up my floorboards to inspect the tiny fissures. Where I want to go, there can be no weaknesses, no fissures, and no fears. I knew some of the secrets of the ages lay in this simple, short material given with so much power and clarity. I say the word secrets. And any woman reading this manuscript will tell you she knew this. But we have been shamed and quieted for so long that we have long ago stopped trusting those inner knowings. 
Magdalene was rousted from where she lay within the soul she shared with her beloved Yahshua by Isis and Metron, Metronon and asked to come to tell her story. And I had put a throw rug out to greet her. I have only two commitments. One is to the truth with Tom. And the other is to look at all my unfinished business. I have called that forward now for almost two decades. I just didn't think I could possibly have this much unfinished business. The Feminist Rises, second entry, December 2000, Outish. This material was given over a period of time between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2000. Mary Magdalene first came through one night in Zurich, Switzerland, in a small hotel in the old section of town. She continued her delivery as we zagged across the breadth of the living, living Mediterranean, triangulating Sicily, and wound up living on Outish, the smaller Malta island. Magdalene completed her editing portion herself, word by word, shortly after the above-described physical storm passed, just before Christmas 2000. So in uh, 2000, I had to think for a second. In 2000, I was 17 years old. And I've spoken about this on this channel a lot, but if you're new to the channel, um, Magdalene started speaking to me when I was like 16 years old. So a little bit before they started channeling her. And I, again, I've told this story, but I was walking to, I believe it was the language department. The language department and the math department were kind of on top of each other, but I was walking we had a lake at my high school. It was a private school. Lake with swans was over here. I remember I had my backpack on my back. I remember seeing, I remember what I had on too, the outfit I had on. My hair was long. It was hanging down and I was holding my backpack, walking to class. And I'll never forget where I was. I was walking past Wilcox Hall. If you were a Darlington student, you know what Wilcox Hall is, which is where the administration building, the next building over was the language and math department. And there's these wooden steps that go up to, Wilcox Hall and I was on the sidewalk and I remember walking I could see the steps in my peripheral vision as I could see the lake on the other side and I'll never forget holding my backpack and hearing a voice that wasn't my own say Mary Magdalene and I listened again and the voice said Mary Magdalene then once again for a third time it said Mary Magdalene and I was so confused at what was happening because at that point at 17 years old, I wasn't thinking about church stuff. I wasn't thinking about Mary Magdalene or Jesus or any of these people because that's what I did at church. I was more interested in like what the boy in my class was doing that I thought was cute. You know, I wasn't, or what my friends and I were going to do that week. And I wasn't thinking about God. And so hearing Mary Magdalene over and over and over again in my head was so strange, especially since we didn't have the internet. And to, well, maybe we did have like AOL, you know, the, but. At that point, you know, we didn't even have cell phones. And so I didn't have access to quickly grabbing information about Magdalene. Any, any research I was doing was for school. Not, I wasn't researching as a hobby like I do now. Um, and my perception of Magdalene at that time was that she was a prostitute, that this was, you know, what they taught us in church. And that started my relationship with Magdalene at 16 years old. Magdalene continued to speak to me. I'm more clairvoyant than clairaudio. I do hear sometimes, but I mostly see things. But with Magdalene, I've always been clairaudio. She is the one who has led me all throughout my life. She's the reason why I went to, you know, to India. She's the one that told me, go to India, study yoga. She's the one that told me to start a YouTube channel. She's the one that told me to start this playlist on understanding the Magdalene. She has been one of my main guides most of my life. And as this year has unfolded, I now understand more about my soul and her soul and the history that we share. And I, I don't feel possessive over Magdalene because she's not mine, but I love her because she has protected me and loved me my whole life and lives past. And I have loved her too. And so that just kind of hit me that, that this is all happening. They're, they're channeling this from her around the same time that I was also starting to hear her. 
And if you also started to hear her too around this time, let me know. There's a reason why some of us are being contacted by her. No, yes, I have spoken about, I am the Magdalene bloodline. I do, I, I, that's come out over um, the back channels that I am her bloodline. So I am her descendant as well. Um, but that's not really what's important to me because the two lives are so separate. My life today is so separate from her then. There's so many generations that passed that what feels me, what I, I feel more connected to her as hearing her and feeling her beside me, protecting me, holding me, loving me versus just being a descendant of her. So anyway, all right. She had chosen each word before she spoke it through Tom with a sense of power and clarity I'd never heard before from any human or spirit. Yeah, she's very clear when she speaks. There's no mincing words with her. She's very clear when she speaks. She had neither anger nor pity nor any common emotion throughout the telling, but over one thing. When she spoke of the love she felt for her man, Yahshua, her heart trembled. And I cry every time she brought up how hard it had been to take the role of the initiate for which she had been well, well trained and still to be a woman in love with a man for which there is no training under the sun. And he was a man on a mission. How many of these have we known? And the job he came to do was more important than his love for her. How many of these have we known? And in the retailing, he is remembered as the Christ, the Redeemer, the only Son of God, and she is remembered as a whore, though it was she who filled him. How many of these have we known? And she, as the unlimited vessel of energy, gave him the strength to do what he came to do, and so he did it. And then he left. And my little tiny fissure cracked down the epicenter, and by Christmas, the fault line was above ground, visible to anyone who came near. The humbug, third entry, December 2000, outish. December continued to howl across the sparsely treed fields of outish, and a chill wasn't only in the air. I was still hounded by the innocent incident of the email. It was simple, innocent email to Tom, to and from an old friend, but it happened to be an old friend who had an agenda for Tom, one that included a little more than a friendship. This person had hurt me and almost cost us the relationship. I couldn't understand why this person was still in our lives since the original experience had brought such intense anguish. Sacred relationship, the way I want to do it, the way I believe it must be lived, must be the most important process ongoing in life. Reason is out. If I am God and my mate is God, then why would any God outside of us, any practice, any devotion, any being, anything, demand greater obedience than our love. It must be night and day, always at the heart of life, always the most important aspect of life. It must stay in total truth. No dust can be swept under the throw rug, no throw rug covering the slight tiny flaws. And unless it is held as the most valued and sacred experience, it will dwindle and succumb to the tendencies of all relationships. This is the truth I hold in my heart. And it is the truth which no man I've ever known could handle or remain in honor to. And here I was back at the point of truth. I felt like a jealous, scorched woman, a banshee with no compassion. I felt I looked like that. I didn't really think that's what's going on, but so deeply devalued is my self-esteem that I questioned my intuition. Still, if we're not so, if Tom really loved me. Would he still communicate with this person? If he knew that communicating with this person hurt me, why would he continue the communication? Perhaps I should leave. I am impossible to live with. My price is too high for anyone to pay. I demand too much. I give no slack. I have no slack to give after where I've been. But who on earth can stand up to the demands of an unrelenting, demanding woman who carries a picture of a relationship with colors from another universe. And I cannot find the old governors on my thoughts and mouths. The tricks of Southern women have deserted me and I cannot help but say what I think. Goodness, help me. Perhaps I should leave. Outish is said to be the island where Odysseus was held captain by the siren Calypso for seven years. 
I'm captive here. There is nowhere to go. It is a tiny island dotted with fields and Catholic churches and the sweetest, most honest people you will ever meet anywhere. And there is no escape. I am trapped here in my swirling. Perhaps I should leave. Tom doesn't need this after what he's been through. He needs peace, not a shrew. I am a shrew, but I'm right. I'm a right shrew. Sigh. How do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? But at what price does happiness come? Each farmer on Outish has a tiny little plot, maybe an acre, maybe half an acre. They are all incorporately fenced, as it were, in oddly shaped walls of stone hand piled through generations, each generation unearthing small boulders that continually rise to the surface and adding them to the stone wall. So the terrain is a zigzagged by these stone walls like patchwork lines on a quilt of soil. I am like a steam kettle, appearing quite quiet and passive and easy. But if something happens, like an email, I used to begin a slow boil, which took years to steam. Now I just boil over right away and then I hold the boil. I mean, I can really harp over something that seems mildly out of place. I don't mean to, I can't help it. I don't see other dimensions, but I don't miss an energy exchange on this plane. Too many years in politics, I guess. I don't miss the happening energetically around me and I could feel the difference in the air between Tom and me since I questioned this email. He was withdrawn from the dark, moist and dangerous abyss of the feminine. Her price was pretty high these days, I had to admit. It demanded total commitment and total truth, which he always demanded of me. We began to talk about it. I thought I would die. I had to admit I was jealous of an email. I felt disrespected. I felt hurt and abandoned by an email. I thought I would die. I mean, when you cut yourself wide open to another person and talk about all your fears, your jealousies, your inadequacies, your weak floor, you just know they can't handle it. You know your stuff is too ugly, too confining for anyone to stomach. Besides, surely your stuff smells like tuna fish. No one could possibly love you through your truth. I was afraid that it might appear that I was confining Tom. And for whatever reason, I cannot bear the thought of anyone ever confining Tom Kenyon again. I'd refuse to be like the people around Tom and Pam. I refused to be around the pe like the people. I had refused to be like the people around Tom when Pam died, all vying for confinement rights. But Tom doesn't see agendas like I do. He sees deity and spirits and beings from other dimensions, and he talks to them like I talk to the waitress at a restaurant. I see agendas and politics, and my prophetic abilities are limited to human beings around me. I hear what they don't say, and I see what they don't think anyone sees. I see their true motives and am cursed with feeling crazy over oddly unappreciated ability. I saw the meaning behind the message, behind the written word in the email. Not the one Tom wrote, but the one he received. We walked for hours that day over walls and fields all the way to the clefts of Dewerja, a dizzying ledge of limestone hundreds of feet above the Mediterranean. I knew Tom was thinking how nice it would be to live alone. I was thinking how nice it would be to live alone. This was work. But the love is so intense, he takes my breath away. It's an incredible feeling when another human being literally takes your breath away. I've been there. We talked it all over and over and over and over and over and over. Exhausted from the walk and the talk, we turned to head back. Perhaps it was time for us to part company. Then I spotted something on the ground near my foot. It was carved pottery shared of some kind, almost buried in the sand. It was designed like a petroglyph on its surface. Tom and I both stopped to look at this treasure. I reached down and dug it with a rock and it yielded to my, my pressure. We had found an ancient symbol from one of the hundreds of goddess temples all over the island. Perhaps a message for this place where we were stuck. To love or to leave. We almost fell down laughing when we rushed it off and discovered not an ancient amulet or shared pottery, but the cover from a clutch petal left in the sand decades ago. Our ancient pottery shared with someone else's old clutch petal cover. And so we took it as a great sign and we shifted into neutral 
We had each told our truth. We stood there in the light of the long day and just stopped. We went home and we just held each other in truth and total truth. No one has ever stopped my heart like Tom Kenyon. And he will learn to see agendas and I will learn to see other dimensions. But if I don't ever see other dimensions, it's okay with me. I've got Tom to tell me the truth of what's out there. And if he, if he doesn't ever see other people's agendas around him, that's okay. He's got me. And as long as he appreciates my gifts and listens to me and I appreciate his and listen to him, we have total sight between us. Magdalene was right. Appreciation at the very least is required. Hauntings. Fourth entry, July 2001. Paros Island, Greece. I am haunted by many things as I contemplate placing this material into the world at large. The responsibility of putting such information into print weighed so heavily this particular night that sleep deprived me of her peace and I find myself sitting at the small kitchen table, palm top in hand, so to speak, braving the mosquitoes of Greece. They are small but ominously dangerous in their predatory nature Humless, they are deadly in their silence. They are truly among the little things that can really make a point in life. The Magdalene consciousness is upon the earth plane now as we realize the truth of the emotion and physical and physicality of passion and welcome the return of a divine principle. In your journey, you may have encountered some of the many other visages and voices claiming to speak for the Magdalene or even be her. They tell different stories, these different Magdalens. Some channels I have great respect for have been given the story that she and Yahshua were together as consorts but had no children. Some have been given the story that there were many children. Some say that Yahshua died on the cross during his crucifix crucifixion and that Magdalene carried on teaching alone. Some versions say he did not die on the cross but lived with her for many more years. And that the crucifixion was nothing more than a hoax to earn his freedom as a real crock of fiction. No, no, no. It's not a hoax. It's just a made-up story because Yahshua's story took the Jesus story. And the Jesus story is the Mithra story. Because remember, as Magdalene has been very clear with me, human sacrifice is not something that God does. It's something Lucifer does. Some say he ultimately died at Masada during the siege. Some claim his resting place is clearly marked in India. One recent version says he's buried in southern France in the Pyrenees. Some channeled versions of Magdalene's story say she lived her life teaching in her own mystery school in southern France and that her bones lie there. Others say she has found her peace, if you will, in England. Others say there is no such one person as Jesus Christ, but that he was a composite of many different teachers at the time, edited together purely to create a new religion to quiet the masses under the Roman government. I am not bothered by the discrepancies, though I admit it would be far simpler if everyone were telling the same story. But they do tell the same story over the significant issues, that this Yahshua and his Magdalene were consorts, and that the church purposely and maliciously mistranslated the word for whore to dismiss the Magdalene, to impale all the femininity with the brand, specifically to further the patriarchy and discredit passion, so that as Magdalene had put it, no one would accidentally stumble on the great truths that lie in passion. What matters to me is this manuscript is the obvious power in her words and the transcendent and powerful love she had held through all time with her beloved Yahshua. In addition to that, the practices she gave creates electrical shift. There is no doubt of that. As I detached myself from the elation and personal high, derived from being present when this material was given, experienced the Magdalene the first hand, feeling her strong and even presence, listening through tears to much of her story, I find myself no, now, only months later, able to do what I do best, be devil's advocate, questioning it and its relevance today. She had chosen each word with such calibrated precision. She was back to tell a story to set the record straight. Much of what she had to do was clarify the misinformation. The lies the church perpetuated, perpetrated, excuse me. And Yahshua had used language that had a meaning to only certain few, language which, when taken out of context, becomes supportive of something in total contradiction to what he really meant. Just sitting down with the master and having some bread and a glass of wine had gone from being something he loved to do with pe people to eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and the church calls others pagan. Exactly. And how would we avoid doing the same? How could we choose language 
and a supportive commentary that couldn't, wouldn't over time be used to misconstrue the real meaning. Are people capable of understanding and choosing the divinity of sacred relationship? Or will they think that this is just a great little manual on how to use sex to gain power? And what about her role in the light of feminism? Was she just another woman who gave her power to a man? In this case, literally gave her power to a man who could not have done what he did without her contribution. If you think this is a sex manual or a story of a woman who gave her power to a man, you have missed the point and will surely not attain the possible. This is a story of what Magdalene called sacred relationship and the internal alchemy is possible within the safety and devotion of sacred marriage. We have been as careful as we could in choosing words with consideration to their long-term meaning. We've tried not to use words or slang used with only certain symbols or metaphysics, hoping that they will not be misconstrued, at least within our own lifetime anyway. Beyond that, we can do nothing but intend truth and illumination. Pondering. Fifth entry, Oprah's Island, December 2001. It had been one year since Magdalene gave us this manuscript. She gave it in two months. In two months, she gave what she wanted of her personal story and what she wanted to share of her story as an initiate in the Temple of Isis. In her slim volume of exquisitely chosen words, she also taught what could be taught, what could be shared for those ready to hear the beauty of it. She gave us some of the deepest secrets of the Temple of Isis and the secrets of ecstasy and have, that have been stolen from us. It has taken me one year to come, to come to terms with it and to add what I have been asked to add, and I am feeling deeply humbled in the job. I have now worked with energy on many occasions alone and with people in my admiration. Indeed, my deepest gratitude for her beauty, her love, and her genius and power all me and always will. I don't know what happens to us humans. We are born with all we will ever need. We are born in beauty and genius. We are born of God and with God fully infused. We are God. There is no God outside of us. That doesn't make me any better than the next person. The next person is God too. That's the magic. We are all God. We are all divine. We look around and we see enough land and enough hardworking people to be capable of feeding everyone on the planet. We see enough bounty to take care of everyone on earth, all the animals and all the creatures. And we swear that when we grow up, we are going to change things. We are going to make a difference. And then something happens. I was lucky. I grew up in the strangest of circumstances, basically away from all common influences, except for when humans tried to tell me something I had experienced different in nature. Although I had humans telling me what to do, I had the counterbalance of deep nature, deeper than anyone I've ever met. And I couldn't see this sin we were all supposed to be born in. I saw beauty. Despite what the people around me told me, I saw beauty in the love possible between people. And I couldn't imagine how such beauty could be evil. And then I went out to the world and I got hurt. And my giving nature was met equally by the taking nature of many around me. Same sister, same. In all the pain and hypocrisy and bigotry and judgment I saw growing up was caused by the belief in Jesus Christ. I didn't experience beauty coming out of the love people claimed for this being. And then I grew in my own spirituality and I came to understand that he was a great master teacher. One of many the world has been gifted to know but indeed a great master teacher in whose name governments created a religion. How ironic then that Mary Magdalene should use the phrase, we're gassed that the master would help such a one. So that is my experience of Christianity. How ironic this material would come to such a one as me. And I truly understand that because I have been called all sorts of names by Christians. I've even been called, said that I'm from the pits of hell just for reading the missing books of the Bible, just for reading them. Larry Gator said that his job was to decapitate witches, and he was coming from that for that witch price down in Atlanta, Georgia, which is an actual threat. 
But lo and behold, Magdalene's been speaking to me. So I understand why she's saying that and how she's feeling. And I think many of you guys watching right now probably have felt that too, that you weren't religious enough. Maybe you liked your rock and roll music and maybe you were a little bit more open-minded when it came to other people's faiths and other people's way of life as I was. Maybe the church deemed you unacceptable because you have tattoos like I do, or you practice yoga like I do. And perhaps Magdalene or Yahshua talk to you as well. So I guess I should say, when the visible world around you makes you feel like you're not good enough, take inventory of what the invisible world around you is telling you. Because the invisible world is always telling you that you're enough. All religions are man-made. All of them. But spirit isn't. And you are that spirit. You are that divine spark. doesn't matter if you grew up Christian or Jewish or Hindu or Catholic or whatever. Muslim doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Tabby Joyce used to say, oh, that's all just a circus. It's all just a circus anyway. You. You're the divine spark of creation. You were born with the holiest of holies inside of you. You are the holy grail, not the church. You. Your body is the holy chalice that holds your perfect, perfect soul. A soul that is made of purely unconditional love. Fear of Flying Returns, a closing entry, Ocris Island, December 31, 2001. Just as this book was going into its final edits, Tom and I encountered yet another obscuration to flight. And because it brought up about major shifts and wounds up affording us the understanding, we decided to take a duty to share it. We need to be aware that prickles can lie beneath the beautiful roses when you undertake a sacred relationship. And you need to understand that we work at it every day. We live in an alchemical furnace. The more I understand and experience what Magdalene means by true sacred relationship, the more I live it. The more awed I am by the process and the more respect I have for those of us brave enough to enter the cap catacombs of this process. Something simple happened again. It wasn't a big deal, and it, and it was. It was actually quite like the simple little experience that triggered our journey on Little Outish when my internal storm outflew the external storm. But when one partner does something that hurts the other in a relationship, intentional or not, it must be respected. If it doesn't see the light of examination, it will darken the door of love eventually, either through atherapy or eventually through revolution. When the safety net evaporates, so goes the alchemy. Tom invited an experience of someone into his life, someone I felt was dangerous to him, and he did it without consulting me, or I would have at least warned him about the potential for danger I saw in such an encounter. I am cursed with seeing the machinations of people around us, people on the street. I see agendas. He sees deities. Sigh. I see his vision as a gift. I see mine all too often as a burden. When he told me about the invitation, my gut twisted, my stomach flopped, and my heart raced right out of the door. I made the be bed, dressed, packed my emotional suitcase, and left. I withdrew about 40 years into my childhood, and I said nothing at first. I really tried to stuff my feelings back down, but my heart was making so much noise, I feared it would explode. I have to tell you, I knew my discussion about this particular obscuration to flight wasn't going to be appreciated initially. After all, hadn't we had this experience already on Outish? 
And so it was with great heavy heart that I sat down and began to share what was happening with me as a result of his simple, innocent, but painful to me action. Tom had simply invited someone into the relationship that I saw as potentially dangerous. It was an innocent action, and the individual involved would hardly be considered dangerous by anyone. Intentions were altogether well-meaning, but I saw that inviting this person into our life potentially opened portals through which, shall we say, other presences might find entry. Magda actually called these other presences, these other energy demons in her day. What does this mean? Was I simply being a jealous woman or was I so intuitive that I sensed anyone who was even advertently dangerous? Or was I so controlling that I couldn't allow anyone into our lives that didn't meet my stamp of approval? My initial overturns regarding the subject uh, broke my, just the reaction I expected. And so I began my emotional packing job, ready to go to the heart door. Tom does, but Tom does. He numbed. And there we were. The same magnets that usually draw us together flipped. And have you seen what magnets do when they are reversed? You try to force them together, they repel. It's very hard to talk from your heart when you are repelled. And when you know you repel the significant other in your life. I sat down and talked with him about what I thought had been creating this action and how I felt dishonored when he didn't talk to me before opening this particular barn door and letting this horse out, which was now becoming my mantra. He was appalled by my reaction. Well, of course he was. I probably initially sounded like an insane woman again. I mean, I thought I was right, mind you. In other words, I knew I wasn't insane, but I was afraid he would think me a bit daft. I knew I was even right, at least for me. But I've also learned the other great truth. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? I can't stress how life-threatening this business of being in total truth is to the psyche. You really think you're going to die when you first begin to speak. And there is something deeply scary about the truth, the total truth, not the clean, pretty truth, but the truth that lies under everything, the truth we hide from everyone. And let me tell you, it's really easy to let all of this go and not tell your truth, not stir the pot. I could easily just relax and let it go. We'd have been fine if I just pushed the issue on the surface. But I knew that eventually we wind up just like every other couple in the world today, together, but not really together, codependent to each other's refusal to look at the truth. We can act, you can actually think you love someone so much that you never call them on their stuff, thinking it would hurt them too much. I tell you what hurts, not calling someone on his or her stuff. That's what kills and creates disease and compliance to non-growth and disillusionment. I know in my heart that those little things, those little annoyances, those little nigglings, the little truths, when not shared between people in sacred relationship, build brick walls, over which there is eventually no assault. When you do not share your truth, one morning you wake up and find yourself living with a stranger, a roommate. Read my story again. I've been there, and it's not the road to the sacred relationship. And I wish I could tell you that we figured out the answer by ourselves without help. And the truth is we asked for help. I was losing my mind, haunted by the images of, of myself as a fearful, jealous woman. I mean, I just wrote this whole section and admitted what my fears were, and here they were again. I thought we'd gotten beyond all that. The truth was, I had another ever so slight crack in my foundation, and it left me fearing for my safety and for Tom's safety. And so I approached Tom with my concerns, and our magnets flipped, as we call it, and the always so powerful attraction between us repelled each of us. And we withdrew to our corners. I felt wounded. He felt annoyed. We shut everything down and we asked for guidance. This possibility for transformation through relationship is the most sacred and honored aspect of life to each of us. We have each chosen this and is our agreement to continue to choose relationship. And we were stuck and needed help. I know we are fortunate beyond imagination and that we have such access to guidance. And it is because I know not everyone has such access that I share what we were told. It was explained to us that who we are is forged from our childhood in a myriad of lifetime experiences. The swords each of us carries into relationships are forged into the, the heart and the heat of pain and out a terrific and out of terrific smelting. We are set 
a void from such experiences, it takes at least equal heat to reforge us, to change what we are, to burn off the obstacles to flight, as Magdalene calls them, to burn off the dross. And this is so true, not just in relationships with other people, but with the relationship within yourself. We talk about the yoga fever, the burning of the getting sweaty in your practice, the burning of old patterns physically and spiritually. This is so true. We have to go through the fire, have to within ourselves and with our, in our relationships with other people. I want that burn, though I admit I sometimes fear the heat. And it really helped me be told that we weren't doing anything wrong, but that in fact, this is the process and this is the experience and that this experience was an indication of where we were in the process. Tom and I had chosen to share this personal piece of guidance in the hopes that it answers some questions. The answer lies in the context of alchemical process. Are you showing the face of the jealous woman or the face of a woman who sees danger? It is the process between the two of you. You must speak the truth of what you are experiencing and Tom must speak his truth from what arises within him, the conflict or the harmony. Those are the two faces. And this melding is the process of burning off the dross. So the two of you are in an alchemical process and you are doing everything quite accurately. We understand it is a very difficult situation. You are looking for an answer that keeps you from the heat, but the heat is required. There are psychological patterns within in each of you that might call that you might call negative or less than resourceful, and they are melded with aspects that are positive. The jealous woman is bonded with the person who feels danger because when you make still, you bond. When you make still, you bond, you make an alloy. And what made you was your childhood. You are taking the swords of your identities and sticking them in the alchemical furnace. And there is no answer to make this easier other than to understand that you are in an alchemical process that you willfully chose to enter. When your swords begin to dissolve, it feels like you are losing your identity. And that makes sense. I mean, I watch a lot, you know, I've been kind of studying twin flames since my early twenties when I read Plato's symposium for shits and giggles, because that's just the kind of person I am. I'm a nerd. And that happens a lot. So again, twin flames are the same soul. They're the same soul that's split into two people. And according to Plato's Symposium, we did this in order to understand love. Um, we had to split into two so we could truly understand unconditional love. And she talks about the magnets. So twin flames are pretty drawn to each other, but then they also repel each other. And that's why they say like with a twin, twin flame journey, you don't meet your twin until later in life because you have a lot of work, alchemical work to do on yourself before you can alchemically work with your twin. And that fire, a lot of times twins, from what I understand, will meet and then they'll go through a horrific separation and won't talk for a while. That repelling and then they'll pull back together again. And in that separation and that repelling is where the most transformation is, having for, is, is happening for both of them. And through that transformation within themselves, they discover that unconditional love again for the other person, which is really them because it's their soul. I mean, you are independent from your twin. You can choose to be, you are your own independent, full human being, right? And there are some incidents where one twin will do the work while the other won't. And then therefore they are incompatible because one has advanced their half the soul while the other hasn't. And so this is making perfect, perfect sense to me. The answer is for both of you to speak the truth about what faces you have on in the moment. When the furnace gets so hot, the magnet flips. It is because the heat is so intense that it is changing the structure of the magnets. The magnets are created through polarization in each of you. You are drawn to the polarization in each of you. So there is a match. There is a magnetism that pulls you together. When the heat is turned up, the magnets reverse and with all the intensity and usually pull you together and you are then repelled. This is temporary. Just right through it. Don't read anything into it. That makes sense too. Cause a lot of people say when you're in that separation period from your twin, don't even think about them. Just focus on yourself, right? It will return back again. 
There's a part of you that is searching for evidence for clues that you are in a dangerous territory and that you need to escape. There is no escape in these times, only truth. Understand that you are in an alchemical process when you are in a sacred relationship and you search for pictures. And sometimes when the pictures don't match, you get scared. You are in an alchemical process. As this heat gets turned up, you can't take that heat. Go to another place where the heat is not so strong. Pause and let the world stop and take each other's hands. For the last thing you want to do is touch each other in these times and speak the truth about what face is showing itself. Understand that telling the truth is not going to break apart anything. Don't let anything come between you. You must live in a fluid environment so there are no demand, demands. So if the heat gets too hot, you can stop everything and grow, go through the truth process. You must live in a free floating environment so you can go into mystery. When the feminine nature has discovered something she treasured, she becomes a fierce protectress and she wants to protect it at all costs. Jealousy is a face that presents itself in the course of life experiences. The problem is not with jealousy. The problem is not speaking the truth of what one needs. To go out on a limb is to speak the truth, facing the possibility that the other one may not be willing to give what you want. Relationships are rather like poker games, with everyone bluffing about who has the higher card. When you go in a sacred relationship, all the cards are laid out on the table for each to see. Whatever arises, it is simply put on the table. Because the clarity of the two people looking at all the card allows for the possibility of transformation. Let me sum up. Always stay in truth. It's going to get hot. Don't give up. Buy a clutch pedal cover and put it on your altar. Hold hands and walk across the burning coals. And I promise you, you will think you are going to die. And you won't. Postpartum and afterthought. This is what this... This is a story of what Magdalene calls sacred relationships and internal alchemies possible within the safety and devotion of sacred marriage. We do not live in times of light. We are, as Magdalene says, at the beginning of the ending of time. And time is short, and so secrets are being revealed in hopes that more people will wake up and make the relevant changes necessary to make a difference. I am reminded of a story of a young man walking along the beach. In the distance, he sees what looks like tiny dots all over the beach and the shape of an old woman bending down and then walking to the edge of the sea and tossing something into the sea and then walking back, bending down again and picking something up and throwing it into the sea. As he approaches, he sees the beach is littered with starfish left behind by a quickly receding tide. There are hundreds of starfish dying on the beach and one woman picking up one at a time, walking to the edge of the sea and tossing one back and then picking up another. He is astonished at the impossibility of her task and says, why on earth are you doing this? What are, why are you bothering? You can't save enough of them to matter. She threw one more starfish into the sea and yelled into the wind. It matters to that one. As Magdalene said her final transmission, I realized in sharing my story that only a handful of will understand, but that is enough. In sharing one woman's story, I realize that many will criticize me. Some will be jealous of me. Some will call me names. Many will judge. I choose to honor the request from Mary Magdalene that it be included because I have come to unflinchingly and without hesitation adore her and trust her wisdom beyond my fears. May you find your own sacred marriage in balance, evenness, and ecstatic devotion with one another and with yourself. <laughs> what will happen when one woman writes the truth about her life? The world will split open. Addendum. We entreated Mary Magdalene with numerous questions after she delivered her manuscript. There were certain questions we knew we would be asked when we presented this material to the world. Some of the questions we asked were personal, but we felt it important to ask them when we presented the opportunity. 
She answered some of these questions, but often her answer was, tell them Mary Magdalene has no comment. We share this with you to show you more of the personality of the being we experienced. Her boundaries were clear. She had no difficulty delineating what was her personal business and what information might be of help in this time. She had no patience for questions that achieved nothing but reduce her story to the idle conversation and irrelevant trivia. Rather than write a dialogue, we presented these questions and answers exactly as they were asked and as they were answered. Question. Were you and Yashua married? Answer. Yashua and I were mat married in a rabbinical tradition. In the gospel, they report that Yashua turned water into wine in a wedding. What they failed to mention was that wedding was ours. It was known. There are two paths that sometimes overlap. One is initiation and one is marriage. Initiation is entering a higher threshold of understanding and ability. Initiation, initiations are given to solidary individuals. Those in sacred relationship step into this through their mutual intention. Acknowledged by another is unnecessary. That is the cultural way of doing it. Those who enter into the heart of sacred relationship will go through initiations as a result of their entering into the mysteries. What is important is not to act, but the process of the sacred relationship. How does the sex magic of Isis change for women who have a hysterectomy or menopause? Sexual fluids of a, nature, of a mature woman who has gone through either of these, of course, is different from a woman who is fertile. So the interaction of semen and a woman's sexual fluids do not have the same energetic con constituency. However, there is a reaction and more importantly, all other aspects of sex magic of Isis is applied. The stroking, the touching, nesting, and all create the magnetic field, which can be drawn into both initiate subtle bodies. And so while the act may not be as dynamic as in their youth, it is still effective. And I think that's not going to be a problem in the, the new world because I don't think we're going to go through menopause. How does sex magic change with men who have had vasectomies? The possibility of vasectomies was not a consideration during my time in the temple of Isis. From the standpoint of the sex magic of Isis, the truth of the matter is that the man must rely upon stroking and touching and nesting to create the magnetic fields. The question implied is, will sex magic work for a man who has had a vasectomy? Yes, but with one consideration. Because the magnetics of the semen are denied interaction with sexual fluids of his partner, he must actually stroke and touch his partner more than normal in order to build those same intensities of magnetics and vasectomies can be reversed. At this point, if I were a man and I had a vasectomy, I would get it reversed for sure. Question. In the manuscript, you said that the issue that men had with their mothers might affect the alchemy between them and their partners. Does the same hold true for women? Does their relationship with their fathers affect the alchemy. To a certain extent, yes, a girl's experience with her father by necessity colors her interactions with her partner as a woman. And so to this extent, the effects are similar. But what I wish to point out is in regards to the male initiate is the unusual vulnerability that the male experiences in relationship to the female. A daughter was never carried by her father, for he does not have a womb. Her body was not formed out of his elements. The son, on the other hand, is carried within the womb of the mother and is surrounded by her during his development. And once he is born, he begins the process of separation. Once this development reaches a certain eight stage and there were issues with the mother that were unresolved as a man, he may find it difficult to nest because to nest is to be surrounded by the feminine energy once again, as he was in utero. That's so fascinating. And this is a different situation than women and issues she may have with her father. That is so freaking fascinating. So guys, there you go. If you got mommy issues, they are different from daddy issues with females because we were never in our father's body. We're only in our mother's body. So Magdalene's dropping some truth bombs here. That was, that's, that's deep. Question, do you have any comments about the other major alchemical streams that teach that man should ret retain his semen during intercourse? Magdalene, you may say, and she laughed, my bias, you understand, is a priestess of ice, Temple of Isis, and the alchemy I was trained in is feminine-based, and we view some of these things quite differently than other streams you mentioned. 
For one, we hold the creatrix of all time and space, whom we call Isis, is enfolded in the natures of all women. It is part of them, just like the seeds of a fig are hidden within it. We also understand that alchemy was based upon the joining of the two opposites, the male principle and the female principle. But in the way of the alchemy, the wo woman is understood to hold the alchemical keys. The male is needed in order to turn the keys. Just got hit with something someone said to me once. Wow. And it is the mutual joining together of these polar opposites embodied within the male and female initiate that the alchemy takes place. From our perspective, the withholding of the male semen is just another way, another playing out of his general tendency to withhold. It is true that a male's vitality is related to the energetics of his seed and that the reckless release of his semen can affect his vitality. However, when a man releases his seed into his beloved and he nests with her energies, he is fed and nourished by the magnetics as the door to her inner nature opens, flooding both of them with life force. This is a different alchemical path than any other streams on earth at this time. That makes total sense to me. Question. Did you form a mystery school or teach in France and England? Upon landing at St. Marie's, my first and foremost concern was safety of Sarah. And so we headed north to the Druids of Glastonbury and to Tar. And when Sarah was 12, I returned to the reeds to do the water of the Isis ritual. But then Sarah was not in danger. And our return to England was more leisurely. I formed some teaching circles after Sarah wed, made a periodic, periodic trips to, into France and to parts of England where I did teach the mysteries of the temples of Isis. But all of that happened, in my opinion, here in the United States, what we call the United States. Just remember France, what we call France or Gaul at that time was Canada. So when she says things like France, I think she's referring to Canada because that was during her life because I firmly believe, firmly believe that they were here in the United States. Is Magdalene a title? That's the question. Magdalene, it's a title of spiritual recognition. There's an order of Magdalene. It is hidden. Yep. She got it from her mom's family. That's what she told me. I know who her dad was, and I'm not going to say the name of her dad. I might have said it before. He's in the Bible, and I think people are going to be shocked when they realize he was actually her father. She got her name from her mom because her mom was like super high initiate. So she learned a lot from her mom. And she said in the, in the Sophia Code, like her mom had studied in India. Her mom had done all these traveling. She looks just like her mom. She looked identical to her mom. So, um, and that's what she kind of told me that Magdalene means womb. And there is an order than Magdalene, but it, it's, it's, she tells me it's deeper than that. It comes through her mother's line. Question. What is the reason for the use of the reptilian imagery as used in the alchemies of Horus? Magdalene. Answer. These serpent images were used to communicate with the serpent-like structure of Shechem as it moves up the, the jed, which is the spine, the kundalini, basically. As these energies released by the alchemies of Horus rise up the jed, they are snake-like in nature, undulating in their words, and as they enter the head, they often tend to spread out across the hemispheres of the brain like a cobra that shows its hood. Thus, the serpent is form is a metaphor, a symbolic element that points to the deeper structures and nature of the consciousness as it moves to the subtle body, the ka. Question. The gospel reports that Yahshua exercised seven demons from you. What was that? Magdalene's answer. Yahshua performed a rite of purification, clearing out what we call negativity from my seven chakras. It was a chakra clearing. The seven demons are simply negative energies that we all carry from time to time in our fields. He cleared this from my fields in preparation for the deeper alchemy we were to perform together. What is not clarified is that I clear the seven chakras from him as well. I perform the same process on him. The principle is this. As one increases the powers of one, one's illumination or spiritual nature, one becomes a magnet. For many energies that are not one's own. This is true when a person is in lower emotional state. It becomes open to negative forces or energy. Which in Yahshua's times were called demons. This is because this becomes especially true when one is intoxicated or altered through drug use. If one's emotional tone or vibrational state is low. One opens the door to these negative and sometimes destructive energies. However... Paradoxically, something similar occurs when one moves upward into higher states of consciousness because one becomes a magnet 
or an attractor for these negative energies. And we all have occasions when we are not aware and sometimes place, places are frequent in that are not our best interest. And this is when these energies ride in, so to speak. The process was simply an ancient practice that stretches back to the temples of Isis. It was a process of purification of the seven seals that drives out any negativity that we may carry and that we may not even be aware of. This is accomplished through the use of secret mantras, prayers, and a direction of light through intention or will into these centers. It is a complex process that not everyone is capable of. So to give the method methodology, so to speak, to the masses would be a disservice because distortions would occur. It takes a level of mastery to clear the seals and the method that I used to clear him and he used to clear me. Yet once again, we see in the gospel accounts of this, the one-sided and manipulative perspective that Yahshua came to me for this purification as well was never reported. And yet they knew about it. Question. What is it meant by the return of the cosmic mothers? It is a shift of collective consciousness at an honoring of the feminine. It will show up as a global and collective understanding of the sacredness of the earth herself. So that instead of raping and pillaging the earth, there will be a co-creation of the earth and women, those souls embodied as women will be elevated to a place of equality of appreciation along with the male principle. As you can tell, this earth has a long way to go before it reaches this question. Do you mean it will be a long time before this happens? No. I mean, it will be a big leap in consciousness from where humanity is now collectively. So thus, we can see or understand the need of purification. The need for, fear, for, for purification decreases as each person comes into balance with the male-female within and moves into a place of honoring those externally in embodied male and female relationships. We asked Mary Magdalene if she had had any other incarnations, and she told us she had had no other incarnations. Her life as Magdalene is the last incarnation up until this point. My understanding from what she's told me, she is planning on coming back. Mary Magdalene made several references into our conversations to those aligned with the new earth. When we asked her what would qualify those in alignment with the new earth, she replied without hesitation, no guilt, no shame, and no regret. I find it very powerful that this book actually ends on page 311. 311 is a huge number. I see it all the time. And it's very significant for Twin Flames. It also signifies Ascended Masters are with you. So I wanted to share that with you guys. You're seeing that number 311 and the fact that we just ended on page 311 is, there are no coincidences. All right. Let me know your thoughts on this book down in the comments section below. Once again, next week, we will pick up with the Hathor material. <laughs>